Today is May 7, 2014. My name is Martin Donacimento, and I'm interviewing um, Federico Suberbi for the AEJMC Diversity Oral History Interview Project. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Suberbi. My pleasure to be here. For thank you for coming and talking with us. And Finding the time in your schedule, I know it was hectic. Uh, yeah, I just came in yesterday from Kent, and I'm delighted to be here today. Okay, boy. Um, let's see. Please know that the interview will be housed in the AEJMC archives, and also actually here at the, uh, uh, what's it called? The Museum for American History. I can't remember the name. That's fine. Um, and uh, that the interview... Uh, it says here that we will post the interview on the internet. As far as I know, there aren't any plans for that right now, but that's a possibility. Whenever it happens, it's fine with me. Okay, great. Um, let's just start ch chatting, kind of going through the list here. Uh, can you tell me where uh, your interest in journalism came from? Or um, Let's see, you said that you worked in a journalist in Puerto Rico. Is that right? I did. The, the interesting part of the story, of my personal story on this, is that as a high school student and even up to my first year of college at the University of Puerto Rico, my focus was to be uh, an aeronautical engineer. I wanted to design airplanes and rockets and whatnot. I was good in high school with the math and the sciences, but when I got to college, it didn't match up for a number of reasons that we don't have to go into in this interview, but what did happen was that I was witness to the protest against the Vietnam War in front of my university, uh, the University of Puerto Rico, and what I saw in, in my own eyes, my own eyewitness account, differed enormously from the media accounts of what was ha going on, what had happened the day before. So uh, when I'm looking at this, there's a mismatch, and I'm starting to say there's just something wrong here, why? when at a later time I move into the social sciences because I really did bad in math in my college years. I, I did very, very well in the social sciences. I decided to explore media and political communication and propaganda and nation building and things like that that attracted me to the study of the field of communication. My last year of college was the beginning of the design of the master's degree in public communication at the university. So a year later, after, a year after I graduated, I was one of the first 33 students to enter the master's degree in public communication at the University of Puerto Rico. And by then I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to write about journalism. I was working at the San Juan Star as a copy boy, you know, the go for it, go for this, go for that, and reading all the news and putting them on the different editor's desks. Well, in that experience, I did write a couple of uh, freelance writings. But I also saw the lifestyle of the journalist in the newsroom, and I said, that's not me. So as I'm finishing my master's, I'm exploring going into a PhD in communication because I wanted to do research about media and politics. And so it happened. I was admitted at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, one of the best programs in communication back then, still today. And so I began my degree and my studies and what has continued to be my research into media and then eventually media Latinos in the United States and also Puerto Rico, which I do, and Brazil, which I do some research about too. But it's been a social science approach to the study in the field, uh, much less being a journalist. Sure, okay, sure. Um, so would you, would you say that it was uh, primarily from that first encounter with the Vietnam uh, War and the coverage and the, the protests uh, that you, you, you kind of first became aware of the need for um, kind of a, a more, uh, here it says kind of diverse, uh, more diversity in, co in coverage. Um, I guess maybe more, w was that your first experience with seeing the news and saying there's something wrong with this? Uh, had you... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the, the uh, as a Puerto Ricano in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. that's it. I'm, I'm not a minority of anything other than my political views, which are for Puerto Rico's independence. Mm -hmm. And that'll come into play later as the story will continue. But 
in terms of ethnic or racial diversity, I had nothing, I, I wasn't even aware of my being a Latino or Hispanic until I had to fill out forms to apply for my studies at Wisconsin and then fellowships and whatnot. So, oh, I guess that's the closest category, but I'm just Puerto Rican and this ethnicity and racial issues were not into play. The experience of watching the events and the protest and then reading the news the next day was one that told me, look, there's something wrong with the system and how stories are covered and their political meanings and, and how they're presented to the public for political purposes. Years later, we found out as the, Cointel Pro, uh, the FBI's Cointel Pro operations were revealed that there was a purposeful manipulation of certain political news in different parts of the, the United States, certainly in Puerto Rico, where the left, the pro-independence forces were undermined, they, they, they were sabotaged, and I'm sure that, in fact, it was the case that there were some FBI facilitators in presenting news, people who were told by the FBI what to do how to present stories, or they, they gave them a frame of reference for telling the story about the protest and those leftist folks, that troubled me as I began my political awakening, because until then, I was so apolitical, relatively speaking, but seeing the contradictions of what I witnessed versus what I was reading and watching in the news alerted me to that there was something wrong and I wanted to study it. And so began my, my research and, and inquiry into journalism and communication. Sure. Can, can you um, describe for me a little bit about uh, your studies, what your focus was on uh, at the University of Wisconsin? And yes. <clears throat> well, my studies at Wisconsin were directed with my desire to understand the political economy of the media system of Puerto Rico, because I wanted to understand why the, 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 the decision makers in Puerto Rico in terms of news construction did what they did and that was tied to the ownership of the media and then the operations of the media. So I wanted to study that a little bit more systematically. So when I, want, when I got to Wisconsin, it was my interest to study the political economy of not only Puerto Rico, which I eventually wrote what is still today the only political economy extensive writing about the island's media system back in 1992 but also to understand media and politics in Latin America. Uh, another turning point in my uh, decision to study communication, media and politics and economics and, and that line of, of inquiry was that as my master studies were progressing, I had an opportunity, just a series of circumstances, that led me to the gathering of the most progressive minds of media in Latin America. Adman Matelart, Hugo uh, Asman, Hector Schmuckler, and a whole bunch of others had gathered at San Jose, Costa Rica for an international conference that they had. And I read the news at the newspaper that I was working at, and within less than 48 hours, I made my way to Costa Rica on my own with some help with friends. And there I was in the midst of this, just as I was finishing reading the book titled uh, Comunicación Masiva y Revolución Socialista, Mass Communication and Socialist Revolution. That was Armand Matelart's, one of, uh, uh, one of Armand Matelart's and a couple of others' books. So I was getting to understand how the media and politics and the economics work together to direct people's opinions about the system, about the politics, about Puerto Rico. And I wanted to study that more. And I did that at Wisconsin. Now, what happened was that at Wisconsin, to study media and politics and media systems, it was a challenge because it was very much a social science empirical oriented university and school of journalism. So by another chance of, of life, I helped do some coding for a study that had been conducted about Hispanics, Mexican, Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans in Chicago and was allowed then to use the data that had not been reported on from that survey, the, the fellow Daniel Duran and um, uh, Salces, I, I forgot his first name just for, for a moment, used that one in Wisconsin, Daniel Duran in Chicago, and the other one in, uh, at Wisconsin, the other guy in Chicago, they did it for their dissertations, their respective dissertations. So Daniel Duran looked at the information use for libraries and it was communication for use for libraries and information seeking for the Latinos in the Chicago area 
For the other fellow, it was politics, and he didn't do communication. He was just looking at politics. Well, since Daniel Duran didn't look at communication and politics, and the other fellow didn't look at politics and communication, I was allowed to develop studies about that rich minefield of data, and eventually wrote my dissertation on that. But while I was in that process, I got lots of support, like my, one of my great mentors, Felix Gutierrez, and another one, Jorge Chement, who valued what I was doing in studying Latinos and media in the United States, one of the very few people who was doing that, because they had done it, but they were on, uh, on a number of different paths. So they supported my efforts to study Latinos and media. And so began what I could do closer to my culture, Latinos, in studying Latinos, media, and politics, and Latinos and media in general, and whatever it was that I was developing at the time was new, pioneering, I figured, I was told, and got support to continue doing that. In the meantime, in 1992, by then I was already a professor here at the University of Texas because my first job was at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where I cut my teeth as the saying would go in terms of what it means to be a professor. At the time, I had no idea or intention to stay as a professor in, in, in the United States. I wanted to go back to Puerto Rico because part of my studies had been funded by the University of Puerto Rico system, uh, University of Puerto Rico uh, presidential system, and I had an obligation to go back. But as I finished my studies and I got the job at Santa Barbara, the political party and power in Puerto Rico changed from center to right wing. And I found out many years later that the president of the University of Puerto Rico system said he didn't want any more pro-independence professors in the School of Communication, and Federico Subervi shall not get a job. And my doors, the doors were closed to me in the whole University of Puerto Rico system. And as much as I applied and tried to get back to Puerto Rico, I never got a positive response from any university any system in Puerto Rico. I mean, the University of Puerto Rico system campuses or anywhere else. So I started in Santa Barbara and eventually ended up here. While here, I did the first study with Aline Frambe Buxeda and Nitza Hernandez on the political economy of the media system of Puerto Rico. So I continued my interest in Puerto Rico, doing what I could, and parallelly developed the study of uh, Latinos and media in the United States on all branches, children, politics, whatever I could work with students or my, on my own, I developed that. And the third branch of interest became race and media in Brazil with Fulbright support and a couple of other supports, lots of support from the ELAS office mm -hmm. who funded my travels and my research there for many years. That's fascinating. Actually, um, Did we lose the audio somewhere? No, 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 we're fine. <coughs> I, I hope I'm not, I'm not stringing along too many not things at, at all, the same not time. Not at all, not at all. Um, no, I, I, uh, my, my original proposal for, for the Latin American Studies School was to study kind of racial, race and media in communications in Brazil, actually, uh, through photography specifically. I can connect uh, you with the folks I know there. Huh, boy. Yeah, there, okay. there, there, there's a group of Afro, 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 uh, Afro Brasileiros who are studying mm -hmm. racism in media, mm -hmm. and they form a group on Nucleo de Pesquisa, uh, uh, surrounded around the uh, University of Sao Paulo, mm -hmm. and I've got a whole bunch of connections for that. So we'll follow up okay, on that. Okay, absolutely. Yep. Um, I guess I guess uh, the the next question is just kind of. As you were as you were studying at the University of Wisconsin, working on your dissertation, um, what what was the state? You you said that your 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 studies uh, 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 regarding uh, Latinos in the American media was kind of um, relatively new. Relatively new. Was there yes. was was there was there anything that was known about it, or was it kind of just like a wide open? Just because it'd be interesting to contrast kind of how things have changed along, along uh, over time. It, when I started studying Latinos and media mm -hmm. while well, I was at the University of Wisconsin, I went to the library and did as in-depth research I could about anything and everything I could find. 
the two tracks that I found that were emerging were the ownership and history of Spanish language media in the United States. So Felix Gutierrez and Jorge Chament had worked together on the history of Spanish language radio and television. Each one did a dissertation, one on uh, Jorge on radio and Felix on television or the other way around. I can't remember that right now. I also found some survey studies that had been uh, done even here at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, State Senator Judith Safirini was one of the first to study Mexican Americans' use of media. And there was maybe another handful of people who had looked at use of media and also the history of Latino media in the United States, but very little. And there was hardly any study that I could recall that connected use of media and political knowledge, opinion, behaviors among Latinos, since I was always interested in politics. And the survey that Daniel Duran had conducted in Chicago allowed me to connect media and politics. The, the, I, I started working in that area. There had been some studies that Rudy de la Garza and a couple of his colleagues at the Center for Mexican American Studies had conducted about use of media and, and politics. But the research questions that they had, or at least the, the items that they used for assessing use of media and then political knowledge and opinion, were not the best constructed or the best revealing questions that could make a strong connection between use of media and political knowledge and behavior. And much less had they had comparisons of Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and Cubans, or any other ethnic groups. So that was part of the work that I was pulling together. And still as of today, there are a lot of studies that look at history of Latino media, the ownership. There's, there's still more a number of people interested in that. And there's some use of media, certainly for marketing, public relations. And another branch that has developed is the content analysis of films, uh, analysis of some TV shows, analysis of some print content, a little bit in advertising, still not enough. But in terms of survey research that connects use of media and knowledge and opinions, even from children to adults, is a big gap in the field. And that's something that requires a lot of money to do. But it is a valuable one that should be explored a lot more in the future. And another area that I've developed more recently is emergency communications, how people who are not English speakers get to know what's going on during an emergency. And there's a huge gap in terms of policy and knowledge and implementation of, of emergency communications with Latinos who are primarily Spanish speakers and a few other things. But again, that was finding the gaps that have not been developed and then exploring them. At Wisconsin, it was all beginning. And we're talking about more than 30 years ago. Now there's a, an explosion of the literature in different areas, critical cultural content analysis. Still, emergency communication and effects survey research about media effects at different levels from children to adults is a gap. It's it's interesting because it, you mentioned the the people I think that you mentioned who had had done research at that time regarding specifically Latinos in the media in the United States. Um, they all had uh, Spanish sounding last names. Yes. Um, was was it, at the University of Wisconsin? Was there was there much diversity? Was it something that you found was was adequately addressed? That was. Where did all that well, was, was it something you were <laughs> even uh, thinking about? At, at Wisconsin, it's interesting because at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, I had the blessing of having open-minded professors who allowed me to engage in the field of work that I was interested in. But there wasn't a single professor who could teach me what I learned about Latinos in media. I learned that from agricultural journalism, from sociology, and professors I took in other departments because diversity at the time was maybe blacks and, and whites. There was a sense of, yes, there are other populations, but not as much as it is today in recognizing the changing demographics and the growth of Latino populations and their media. People were not even aware of these populations and their media in terms of the professors that I recall having at Wisconsin. 
at the School of Journalism, and then I did learn from other professors, who more than anything else guided me to literature that then I developed on my own. One thing that I will emphasize and the value and the blessing that I had from being at Wisconsin was the support that I got to engage in this field when it was practically unknown, but it was understood that it could be and it would be valuable, and, and so it happened to be. Over time, I suppose, kind of the same question, um, just kind of comparing your initial experiences to how things have changed um, in terms of people doing, doing this kind of research. Uh, have you seen that, um, uh, that diversity in journalism departments, in communications departments has uh, um, expanded or improved or uh, has has there been, is it is it only uh, minority um, uh, academics who are interested in minority issues? How how have how have you think seen things change throughout your career and your your various positions and your over the last thirty two years since I went to Wisconsin? Uh, in fact, I graduated in eighty four. So that's how many years is that? 94, 2004, 2000, 30 years since I graduated, and then more than that since I started teaching because I started teaching as an ABD in 82. So 32 years of teaching and, and, and 30 years since I got the official title. It's been a dramatic change in the field of communication and understanding and recognizing that the demographics of the country are changing and the media are changing and there is a need to embrace research in these arenas. One of the contributions to the change has been the students that I graduated right here at the University of Texas who became professors. Diana Rios is one of those who immediately comes to mind because she's been pioneering studies and research in this arena. And there are others who have graduated and gone into professional fields and then are also teaching and doing this, uh, this work. The, the, uh, uh, J.D. Rivero, who I was not her dissertation advisor, but was instrumental in her getting into the Department of Radio, Television, Film, and then going on with her PhD, is also doing research in this arena. And there is a few others who will hopefully forgive me for not mentioning their name in the interview. But they've gone out and they've populated this area. And they've been doing research. And where they go and they teach, they also engage in the research and teaching others. What is still lacking is the institutional higher level decision makers who not only validate this work but support it and allow these and others to engage in the field. Think about it for a moment. Even at the University of Texas, the School of Journalism has professors who are Latino, but there isn't a whole track dedicated to getting a PhD in the research about Latinos and media. The Department of Radio, Television, Film had a interdisciplinary concentration of diversity or ethnicity and media. They don't have the researchers engaging in the social science research about Latinos and media. The College of Communication, with advertising and the other branches of the, of the college, have not had and developed and promoted an integrated master's and doctoral program to attract, train, and prepare the future researchers in the social science of communication. It doesn't mean that individual faculty aren't doing their great work, and many of them are. But to have a concentration, so that is missing still. Individual faculty are doing great work. And in, the, in the, these 30 years, the, the studies on the content analysis, the history of these works is exploding enormously. Uh, now that I recall, there's yet another student, Kent Wilkinson, not a Latino, who has branched off and done a number of studies and now also even director at the at te Texas Tech uh, University of a center of a unit that studies Latinos and, and communication. He's done a lot of studies with the history and, and the structure of Latino-oriented media and doing health communication research. So it's not just a, a privy for Latinos or even other minorities. It's still just a lack of the institutional recognition of the value of this to purposely recruit 
and allow for the development of programs at the graduate level. At the undergraduate level, here, there, course, here, there, whatever, but not an institutional effort to develop the, the flagship for studying Latinos and media in all of its areas, not just let that professor do whatever he or she wants. Or it's okay that they do that, but to have the support for developing that institution that can do that. Can I ask you why you think that support has uh, yet to, to materialize? No. The, the, I'll give you the example, and, and I won't mention the name, two names that are, are crucial in this, but when I was at Santa Barbara, a senior professor, I was new professor at the time, and I'm going to admit my own limitations in recognizing what I had to do to get tenure, but I was doing my work. I was just a, a late bloomer, as it eventually uh, turned out. But the senior professor called one of my Latina students to his office and told her, in, in essence, that's a dead end. So you, you're studying Latinos, you've done that enough with Federico, so move on because that's a dead end. Meaning that the study of Latinos that she was engaged in was not worthwhile. If he's saying that to her, he's also implying, he was also implying that what I was doing was not worthwhile. Now, in California, more than 50% of the population, at least of the births, are Latinos, and the next generation is going to be majority Latino, and the Latino-oriented media are, are exploding. So that university, that's, that program, that, that department of communication at, at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where I had my first job, has yet to hire another one, another Latino professor who can engage in that full-time and teach and do the research about these areas that I know of. Maybe that changed recently, but to the last... I heard a had a conversation about this. That's still a gap. So the decision maker there, and I'm not blaming that individual, but the decision maker, makers there have not recognized that. Now, you talk to the professors in different departments, they say, oh, yes, yes, yes. But that there's an institutional high-level effort to make a change is not there at Santa Barbara, where, where I had my first job. At my second job here, it was very supportive. While John Downing was chair of the department and a couple of other folks, very supportive. Then the, the year I left for New York because my daughter had got a job there and I was thinking of uh, engaging back in academics as the director of a department at a university close to where she was working, close to where I grew up as a kid for a few years. That didn't work out. But when I come back, the decision maker, the key decision maker here at the Department of Radio Television, Phil, said to me in these exact words, that Latino stuff that you do is not a priority here anymore. So I'm not going to hire you. Now, there may have been other reasons, but that was the explicit words that she told me for not considering hiring me. And there were other people, maybe in her decision-making circles, that didn't recognize the value of having a senior scholar to continue the research about Latinos and media issues. Oh, that's not as important. Many faculty in this school and other great friends I still have were very sad to hear that. I was devastated. Then I moved on and eventually got the job at the university, uh, at Texas State University, where in my second year there was a fantastic uh, director of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication there who within a few months helped me develop or, or supported my developing a program that ended up being the Center for the Study of Latino Media and Markets. And it flourished for five years. Then a change in administration, and it's like, well, these are the bad things you're doing, we support that, but. And in that but process, it just undermines the efforts, and the support is not as strong as it had to be to keep me there, and I end up at Kent State University, where I have carte blanche and support for doctoral student research assistance and travel money and to develop diversity for the school and the, and the doctoral program, where they do value that, at least that's what I'm feeling and, and receiving right now. Now, let me go back to the University of Texas and Texas State. In 1992, I proposed to the school director here, where, uh, the department director where I was at, Radio Television Film, and to the dean, a program for the college to develop Latinos and media issues, study communication and Latino and Latin American issues. And the dean at the time said in these exact words, that's not relevant here. Studying Latinos and Latin American issues, that proposal was considered not relevant for this college from that top decision maker. Many other people valued it, 
but not the decision maker at the time. When I went to Texas State University, I changed the title instead of University of Texas to Texas State and updated the statistics on the demographics, and within a year I had a center. Again, it depends on decision makers who are either open-minded and supportive or don't have that capacity to understand the value to re research and teach about these issues in, in, in our current society. I, I guess, I guess um, that it, it's astonishing uh, to hear people in California and Texas of all places say that Latino studies aren't the priority. Um, do you think it's because I, I guess I wonder how how that could be the case because they are they've never been exposed to to um, Latino communities or or they just kind of exist with I I I just I have <coughs> I'm flabber, flabbergasted I can't quite understand. Well, f two things for for understanding or trying to understand why some decision makers don't have the capacity to to value these issues and. I'll start with one of them, and that is that they were educated in a narrow field of whatever it was in communication or sociology in which Latinos, they didn't have, if I didn't have any professors at Wisconsin, I doubt that any of them, these decision makers, had any professors who taught these decision makers of the time, and even those who are in power today, to understand the changing demographics and the value of Latino-oriented media, their populations, and the need for studying these issues. So they, it's, it's not part of their radar, their value system, of their priorities. It's other things. Whatever it is, it's other things. And this is some minority thing that maybe some minorities might study here or there, but it's not central to society. Now, we're talking 30 years later, well, 20-something for my experience here at the University of Texas. It's been more than 10 years since I left in which the, the, the demographics have changed, the media have changed, the political power of Latinos has been demonstrated, and there is a different mindset today. Still, when I was inquiring just out of curiosity in a conversation a couple of months ago about the School of Journalism and the college and its interest in hiring someone who could teach social science of Latinos in communication, it's not a priority. So even today, whoever the decision makers are here haven't said, golly, we have to develop this for the future of this college, for the future of the professionals who we will be training in academia or in journalism or in advertising or in public relations. The perspective may be that what they're doing is good enough. But it's really not when there isn't a whole integrated program to educate for the master's level and the PhD level those future professionals. It's, it's considered that the piecemeal effort that's been done in the individual departments, that's good enough and there's no need to develop an integrated program, which is one thing that I'm saying that is, indif is indispensable, should be valued, and should be done not just at the University of Texas, University of California, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, Santa Barbara, Berkeley, University of Miami, I could keep going and mentioning these universities, and they're not there. The one place that comes closest to this but is more on the social, critical, cultural side is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that has about three or four or five Latino faculty who study communication, but they're going into the critical, cultural, deconstruction side and not the survey research and not the political economy of these media systems, so it's a different field and it's still needed, it, there's still the need, I should say, to enhance at the college level, at the university level, an integrated effort to study these populations, their media, and their effects. Sure. Um, one of the, uh, kind of some of the things that you, you've, you've been mentioning uh, are making me remember a point that uh, Mr. Chavez brought up when I was talking with him, which was that the uh, the academic uh, system is structured such that the people who can get PhDs are uh, 
often coming from privileged backgrounds and therefore are rarely uh, minorities. Uh, and uh, that that plays into reinforcing um, a lack of general interest in, um, in uh, minority studies, Latino studies yeah. across the board. Um, is that, is that uh, something that, that you've been encountered as well? Um, or uh, do you have anything to say? Yes, about yes, I do have to say something about the, the pipeline for the future generation of communication professionals and professors. I'll, I'll go with the professors part of it. For the last five, ten years, I've been looking at the list of job applicants, meaning people who have earned or about to earn their PhDs in communication. And this is the list that is available at the AEJMC conventions. More than once I've counted that one third or more of the applicants are people with Asian backgrounds in their names. They may not be necessarily Asian, but they probably are given their names. sometimes more than one-third. And I look through those names, meaning all of those who are getting PhDs across the country, and I hardly ever find any Latino name. Now again, names are not 100% matching with ethnicity, but they are telling. We're not doing a good job at going into the high schools, into the undergraduate degree programs, and cultivating Latinos, and I would say almost the same thing for African Americans, Native Americans, in finding and developing their knowledge and their doctoral programs in the field of communication. And here's another catch to this. Even those Latinos who are engaged in graduate level education in communication are not in the social science and they're not in the statistical analysis. They don't have the, the statistic skills that are needed to engage as research assistants, data analysts, writers, evaluators, and then get publications. So what's the story? Who has those skills? Well, primarily students who have the Asian heritage whose education was very strong in the math and the statistics. So, and the core of students who are being admitted into doctoral programs, these Asian American or Asian students are recruited to be the research assistants and then authors or co-authors of very well done studies on the quantitative side. I would bet that a number of the Latinos and African Americans who don't have those skills are directed more to be teaching assistants. Well, teaching assistants is great experience for going into a teaching college, but not necessarily for getting recruited into Research One institutions. So when Research One institutions receive the applications and they see who has the number of publications on the top journals, it's not necessarily the Latinos or maybe even the African Americans. I don't know that for sure, but it's a challenge, let's put it that way. And bless the soul of all of the uh, Asian and Asian American students who are doing that great work. In fact, I've benefited from research assistants who have that capacity myself. What's missing and what I want to get to in this part of the conversation is the need to purposely recruit and train the minorities who don't have those skills but have to be trained specifically so that they can get that knowledge and then go into the research and the qualitative, the quantitative research, not just the qualitative, but qu just heavy duty research and publication that will open the doors for them in teaching and research, in, in, in research one institutions and then it, teaching these issues and then serving as role models in Research One universities where they can then train more researchers in this arena. So it's, it's a cycle that has to be broken by specifically going out and training these students who are underprivileged, understudied, or whatever it is, 
in the research skills so that they can then become the future researchers, the publishers, the ones who publish and then get the jobs and then do the recruiting and the retraining of the future generations. I guess changing topic. I mean, I, that, that yeah. feels like a very, yeah. a very uh, uh, complete answer. <laughs> well, it, it, and again, I want to emphasize one thing. It's not that individual faculty and, and here or there, there's some efforts because there are dozens of people across the country who have recognized the value of diversity in general and the need to understand Latino populations and African American populations and all of these issues. But rarely will you find the institution that says this is part of the flagship of what we will do for this need that the country will have and already has in trained professionals who know how to write, publish, and do research, public relations, and advertising as an integrated graduate program and PhD program for these goals, not just let that person do that and oh, we know that so-and-so teaches that and that's a, that gender, ethnicity, and media class is good enough. You know, that's okay for, for, for an introduction. We need doctoral level classes that teach the research on the political economy, on the history, on the uses, on the content analysis, on the effects of media for diverse populations, not just that catch-all course that you can write a paper if you're interested, but it doesn't teach all of the research methods, the whole literature in these arenas that are, uh, th that are still in need for enhanced teaching and research. Sure. I, I guess... Like yeah, there's a siren. Yeah. I'm going to wait for that we'll to go by so it doesn't that. end up in the background. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, that's fascinating. You know one thing I won't say on the record, and if this is taping, you can get rid of it. Okay. Part of the problem may be that, that, that this messenger mm -hmm. just comes across too strong for some folks. Hmm. Interesting. Sure. Sometimes the, re the reaction is not that, oh, we're not interested. It's just that, damn, why do you have to bang it on our head so much? Well, because you don't do anything about it. And then you know, the messenger gets blamed and sure. shoved aside instead of People feel listening. To, yeah, they feel, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, there's some folks who feel threatened by the success of minority folks. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Sure. I've known that in many institutions, sure. and not just on my own. I've, I've heard it mm -hmm. from esteemed colleagues whose name I won't mention who say, in fact, we're having a session dealing with that at AEJ the, in, oh. in, in Montreal this year. Interesting. Because well. it's the same story. Yeah, sure. That's fascinating. I, I, I guess because Brazil has such a such a different, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how to qualify it, but a different uh, relationship to, um, to questions of uh, race and mm -hmm. ethnicity, uh, and given your experience working there, uh, I guess I'm just kind of curious, I think it'd be interesting to contrast mm -hmm. how uh, working in the United States or uh, training in the United mm -hmm. States or, or academia in the United States compares to your experience uh, from Brazil, did you did you did you notice anything um, uh, in terms of the faculty makeup, in terms of who was studying what, in terms of yeah. you know the interesting thing about doing research about race and media in Brazil is that the most prominent scholar, who's now retired, Solange de Cruzeiro, Solange Martins de Cruzeiro, is an Italian heritage, white. Italian Brasileira, who engaged in what is the, the most systematic teaching about race and media issues in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo. And now her students who have graduated are the ones teaching these issues in different universities in Brazil and training next generations of these students and professionals who should engage in this. They are a number of years, relatively speaking, behind 
in the national recognition of the need and the university recognition for the need to enhance and, and, and teach these issues and do research about these issues. But they're increasingly, it's, it's an incremental process as it is in the United States in teaching about race and media issues. There is a Nucleo de Pesquisa that is doing studies about race and media, mostly from the qualitative perspective. And most of the studies that I'm most familiar with in Brazil are content analysis of how television and magazines and newspapers have treated race issues. The social science of the use and the effects of those images on the general population and then the Afro-Brazilian population, I don't recall. I'm trying to think for a moment of any studies in that arena, and I can't recall them right now. I mean, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. It's just that it's even further behind than what is going on in the United States. The, the reason for that, again, is because the ideology in Brazil is that there is no racial differences. The reality beyond the ideology is that there are major differences. And you can see that in the treatment of Afro-Brazilians in television shows and advertising, which is one of the first studies that I did back in 1988, one of the first studies of the images of blacks in TV commercials. And I haven't followed that line, but I did a few of those initial studies. And other people have done even better studies, of course, since then. Still, we have a gap in people who are trained and then can train others to engage in the research in this arena. That's the problem for Brazil, and it's the problem in many other parts of the world where racial issues are now emerging. Because for too many years, it was assumed that these racial issues are minority issues in passing. And even the first people that I started studying and maybe still writing about this assume the early sociology approach that minorities come into the country with very little knowledge of the United States. They emerge, they immerse themselves in learning about the American culture and they leave behind their ethnic heritage. That's old theory, old history that I never believed it myself. And after writing about ethnic assimilation and pluralism, I emphasized the part of pluralism, and now I don't even use the word assimilation because Latinos and other groups hardly ever assimilate, they adapt, and it's a sum game. I learn more about the United States culture, yet I also learn about my heritage culture, and I keep this, and I keep that. So the, so the term that I've used is very much, and I've written about this, is situational ethnicity. The situation allows you to express your ethnicity. You engage it and you learn and you express it openly. The situation leads you to believe that there's some sense of discrimination that it's not going to be liked. So you leave it aside in that moment, in that place. But you go to the privacy of your home or you go with friends who value the ethnicity or your whatever it is and you engage in it fully. So it's not a linear process of leaving behind old culture, taking on new culture. Yes, that may be true, maybe in some aspect of the cuisine or in your dress or in your language or your proximity, but you still have a whole repertoire of your national heritage, culture, whatever it may be, or a combination in which you, you mix the cuisine or the music or whatever it is to create a new one, or it's an adaptive process that, again, is situational. Sure. Sure. Um, I, I guess... Um you, you mentioned uh, the, I guess, Brazil's taking up questions of, of uh, racial questions in terms of, I think, university admissions. Yes. The, the quota system. Yep. Um, I, I, I guess I'm just curious if, because it seems like oftentimes uh, we talk about uh, things in the United States as though they were occurring in a vacuum. Whereas there are either things that we can hold up as examples of what we're doing right here, mm -hmm. or uh, examples of what we could be doing better. Mm. Uh, just just going back to, um, and I think I think you've 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 mostly addressed this question. What, was there anything else uh, in terms of uh, academia in Brazil? Uh, because you've said that it was mostly on the qualitative mm -hmm. side. 
as is the case in the United States, although the quantitative side mm -hmm. is starting to, it is more prominent here and it's start, maybe starting mm -hmm. to, um, is, I guess, is there anything else to add? Yeah, in, in terms of Brazil, there's a couple of things. There's a recognition that there's a problem by some key people in some foundation, including the Ford Foundation. And there's a recognition by the scholars that I talked to, and I was there as recently as, I think it was October, November 2013, in which I visited people in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, and I also had a visit to Pontifica Universidade Católica do, do, uh, na Curitiba. So there's a recognition, especially in Rio and, and Sao Paulo, that the problem of the representation has been well documented. So there is no lack of ifs or buts and maybe it may be good, it may not be so good. It's evident. Study after study makes it clearly evident that there's a problem in the underrepresentation and the misrepresentation of Afro-Brasileiros in their media. The question is, what can be done about it among the decision makers? So when I was involved in my conversations with the folks in, in Brazil, it was, let's aim the effort to bring this research to the decision makers, but not just to tell them in some that they're doing a bad job, but to push the button, the envelope, to press on them the need for change and why. Now, the need for change and why requires social science survey research that documents the damage that those images that have been well documented are causing in the population. But I don't think we really need that much individual research in Brazil to note what to know and to take note of what has been well documented in the research in other countries, including the United States, that negative images, stereotype images cause harm to the stereotype and negatively portrayed individuals and groups, as well to the general population that assumes incorrectly who and what those others not like them are. So, if we could get that part to the, uh, of the research and the effort to the decision makers who decide what's going to be in the advertising, what's going to be in the TV show, what's going to be in the news, and what should not be, there'll be a great leap forward. Same thing for the United States, where still there are many decision makers who assume, oh, it's just a joke, oh, we didn't mean that, oh, we think we didn't mean to downplay the value of your research, but where's the effort to sustain it? And this brings us back to the question of the recruiting of the students. It's not just to say, yes, there's a need for bringing more minorities into the schools of journalism and more diversity into the schools of journalism. It's to having systematic efforts. Now, this connects to the situation in Brazil where they have the quotas. Okay, well, if you have a, a group of kids who have you're, you're going to give them all the, the opportunities, and I use this analogy quite frequently. Well, let them run the race. They, they should all be able to run the race. We'll put them on the track and we'll let them run the race. Well, excuse me, wait a minute. Some kids have track shoes and have had training by coaches. And you're going to say, we're just going to put them on the racetrack and whoever wins is just the better one. Those who don't win are not that. No, no. You have to make the effort to give the better track shoes and the specific training to those who haven't had it for years and decades and have a mindset that they cannot have, the, the, that they don't have the skill, and not only change the equipment but their mindset to then compete and assume that it's okay for them to run as equals, not just put them there and, and whoever is best wins. The same applies to the schools of journalism and mass communication and the professors who are being brought in for diversity issues. It's not to say, well, whoever's good, you, you got the PhD and you've got the student, you admitted them and let them see what they do and if they don't succeed, it's their problem, it's their, their lack of skill. No, no, no. It's years of underrepresentation, of undertraining and not having the equipment to successfully run the race in academia. And that's what the effort, that's what I'm calling in the systematic and purposeful effort of the institution to make that change in the recruiting and the training and the retention of, from the students to the faculty to the staff that can contribute to the success of greater diversity. It, it seems like it's all, um, it's all, all leading to 
a place of in in society in the United States uh, maybe uh, maybe the universities don't feel as though this is a priority because it's not being made a priority in uh, broader society uh, in the United States um, or or the decision makers uh, don't feel pressed because uh, for for one reason or another does that does that resonate with you? Yes, it's, it's a combination of factors. People will act when they're pressured to do so and they're brought to understand the value of what they're going to do. But part of that process to be convinced requires that they have some background of their own and personal experience of their own uh, that then validate that action. Too many of the decision makers don't have that background and are not even being pressured and they just hear it here and there. Oh, there's some diversity. Oh, I, I guess that's good enough. Without understanding the complexity and the impact of making major decisions. And major decisions require money. And money then is directed to those that they see in their experience that are pressuring them and they see the value. So it's, it, it's not a catch-22, it, but it is a challenge to educate these major decision makers. Now, one of the most recent programs to be developed from the dean's level is at the university uh, at Cal State University Fullerton, where the dean, because of his vision of the need for diversity for his university, given where it's located and, and the College of Communication that, that he directs, went out to recruit and he hired me to help recruit and develop their center, their program specifically directed to teach about Latinos and media issues. Now, he had some faculty who were reluctant and maybe still are, but the dean now, with the support of the provost and the president of the university, both of whom are by chance Puerto Rican heritage, got the green light to proceed and will establish and make the resources in the hiring and the programmatic efforts that will be available this year and the next year and the next few years at that institution. At other places, there may be faculty who value that individually, but there aren't the major decision makers who say, yes, I understand and here's the effort and money and time and human resources for you and a few others to develop that. That's the, that's the gap. They don't have their experience on their own. They don't have the pressure from the faculty. And after a while, I know it's the case with many others, you get tired of asking and begging and pleading. So you go on and you just do your, your thing in your circle of influence, but cannot make the change at the higher levels of the decision-making processes. I hope that there's more higher level decision-making processes in the near future, because given the changing population, just the demographics, just the demographics of this country, certainly Texas, already California, well, already Texas and California, New Mexico, Arizona, Florida, parts of Illinois, New York, and many others, it is imperative for major efforts to be directed at Latino populations and media the uses and the effects of this on these populations and the general population. And the same is true for the other ethnic minorities in the whole field of communication and many others too. Absolutely, and I apologize for just kind of asking question after <coughs> you question. You can ask whatever you like want. I'm, I'm beating a dead horse, but I feel can, like can I'm you tell, getting educated at the same time. Can, can you tell that I have a passion for <laughs> this? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, uh, um, uh, if there's if there's nothing more to add specifically on academia, I'd kind of like to jump to the the AEJMC sure. part of yes. the question. Yeah. Um, which is just kind of when you joined. Yes. And what prompted you to do so? Yes, it, it's a pleasure for me to talk about AEJMC because it was through the support of particular faculty who were part of AEJMC that I got greater validation for what I was doing as a Latino, as an emerging Latino scholar. My first AJMC convention was probably in 1976. I think it was that summer that the AJMC convention took place at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
and I just happened to step into the room where all the papers had been distributed. Back then, it wasn't electronic. People made copies and left copies and, and, uh, of their papers, and I, I kind of stepped in kind of on the margins and saw this organization and all the papers, and subsequently, I attended. Uh, a few of these conventions became a member, started receiving the journals, and in conversations with people like Felix Gutierrez, and I, I don't remember if uh, th there were many others who validated what I did, and, and, and Mercedes Duriarte here at Texas, I don't remember if she was one of those who I met at an AJMC convention, but I, I, I did receive from those few Latinos and African Americans who attended the convention, validation for me as a minority scholar. Carolyn Stroman, um, uh, I'm just forgetting a couple of other names, people who approached me, put their hand on my shoulder, said, Federico, keep up this work, and studying minority issues is good. I wasn't getting that from my faculty, my, my professors, or my, my colleagues at Santa Barbara, but I did get it at those conventions. And I'm forgetting just a number of many other names of people who supported me. And then even to run for officer, because even as a graduate student, and I think I was still a graduate student at, uh, was it? a graduate student or a really beginning professor, when I was recruited to be part of the Minorities in Communication Division and help with the evaluation of students' papers who submitted them and then got nominated for some position in the Minorities in Communication Division, was chair of the Minorities in Communication Division once, and, and then got recruited to the Minorities uh, and uh, to the Commission on the Status of Minorities. All of those years of participating in AJMC, two things happened. Number one, I got validated for what I was doing. And number two, with anybody who cared to listen, I would talk about the value of diversity. And I was listened to by many folks. There, even some folks at the top level decision-making positions. So panel opportunities, involvement, research, all of that helped me along the way uh, get a good foothold with the organization, and I, I enjoy it sure. very much so. It, it really seems as though it's kind of been a positive uh, force for promoting um, uh, minority or diversity issues at least in, in your experience, uh, based on uh, the kind of uh, validation that, or the, I guess more the connectedness uh, and, and therefore support, and then um, also the access to other mm -hmm. uh, decision makers as a way of promoting. It, can you think of any other ways that uh, it may have been, uh, it, uh, and there may not be none, I'm just yeah. kind of fishing. Uh, no, well, the, 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 value, yeah, the, the value of AJMC mm -hmm. for diversity issues is twofold. Uh, one, with its Minorities in Communication Division, this is where anybody who does research about minority issues or diversity issues has an opportunity to get their work evaluated, even if it's not accepted for a convention. It's evaluated and given feedback that could contribute to the enhancement of that research. For those whose papers and panels are accepted, when they attend the convention, it is a place where they gather and have full support, and they don't have to justify. It's a given that it's valued. So that is one part of it where this networking contributes to the enhancement of the scholarship about minority issues in communication. The other part of it is that there comes a time when people say, well, I don't want to just present in the minorities in communication division. My work is good enough and it should be valued in the communication theory and methodology in the newspaper division, in the advertising division. And as these people, these scholars and students, 
present their works in the other divisions of the organization, then diversity is acknowledged and valued and expanded in those other divisions as well. So it's good for the solidarity that is built around those who attend the Minorities in Communication Division sessions and the business sessions and, and whatever else, and also for the other divisions that need and are really in, in great need for enhancing their diversity. Can you think of uh, any ways for AGAMC to uh, improve in terms of uh, promoting issues of diversity in education and journalism? One of the projects that AEJMC had for three, four years, I can't remember how many, was the Journalism Leadership Institute for Diversity. And here I'm not sure if it's, yeah, it's Journalism Leadership Institute, JLID. And this brought to diversity training a number of minority faculty, women and minority. And it went to oftentimes white women who learned leadership skills for being department chairs and deans. And many of the graduates of that program eventually were hired in those positions. Some people applied and were not ready for those positions, so it was a bit premature for some of them. To the best of my knowledge, and, and here I haven't inquired, so we have to be very cautious with my statement, that program was not funded after a while. I don't know why. The funder said, we've got enough of those, we're not getting the output that we need, or also, a statement that I heard was that, well, we're doing this for the minorities, but what about for the non-minorities who need leadership training as well? So the effort was directed to anybody, but not the purposeful development of those who, had, who didn't have the, the running shoes or the background training. So when it's developed for anybody, those who get selected and rise to the top are those who have the biggest backlog of support and training in this arena without the catching up for those who don't. What could AJMC do? Return to the JLID program, more sophisticated, recruiting more smartly, training more smartly, and also trying to get across to the decision makers in different universities the imperative for diversifying their faculty and not just for diversifying their faculty, for the maintenance, recruitment, the training to keep them. It's not just, here, I'm going to recruit you to run in my team. Up, oh, you failed. Goodbye. I'm going to recruit someone else because you see you're, you weren't good enough. Well, it's not just recruiting, it's the full-fledged roundabout training and paying attention to these people who have great ideas and can make great contributions and supporting them in the process. Um, I'm running out of questions. <coughs> uh, I guess, I guess uh, the, the last question on here is how have you seen AJMC evolve over your tenure as a member? Um, uh, specifically with regards to Hi there. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll answer as soon as the door closes. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> AJMC has changed dramatically in its gender diversity and in fact with a um, another student a, a doctoral student, now a professor, whose name I regret that is, is just, um, she's going to be so sad that I didn't mention her name right now. But we, we did a study in which we assessed the, the leadership. I'm sorry, that, that it was two different studies and I just forget, I, I'm mixing the two. Sure. I'm going to start from scratch on this one. AJMC has changed dramatically in 
many years in many ways. In terms of recruitment of more outreach to diversity, it still lags behind in terms of the ethnic minority, men and women. But it has done a great job in the gender disparity that used to exist from when it started to today. In a study with a couple of other colleagues, we noticed that more than half of the leadership of AJMC has been female in the divisions and at the presidency, with a couple of those being uh, African-American women as well, including this year from uh, University of Texas, Paul Poindexter president, and then a couple of other uh, female African-American presidents as well. So the leadership on the gender side of w primarily white women, some African-Americans, has improved. But at the rank and file, AJNC is still decades, I'm not saying years, decades behind what it should be in terms of Latinos, absolutely way behind in terms of recruitment and retention of Latinos, in terms of its leadership and in terms of membership. Recruitment and retention meaning that you come to one convention and then you feel comfortable and you get uh, participation and then you're brought back and you, you do more things uh, again and again, and in academia in general. So if I had something that I could recommend to AJMC is a JLIT program specifically for Latinos, but I'm not sure they're going to do that. But it would be indispensable given the change in demographics. So J, the, the, the organization has changed dramatically over these years in that, again repeating myself, in the gender disparity, but primarily for white women, bless their soul, each of them very capable, but there should be the similar efforts for the other underrepresented groups that are really way behind. Um, I, I'm out of questions, but I, I'm not out of time. Is there is there anything <coughs> uh, that you feel that we haven't touched upon, uh, or that <coughs> we uh, should should you know just go through in more uh, detail, or um, anything you'd like to add, just generally? One of the things that I'd like to add for this discussion and for the record is the research that is needed not just to document what's missing in journalism news stories and I've done quite a few of them myself on how the network news portray Latinos year after year from the brownout reports back in 1996 I believe it was to the ones I did in 2004, 2005, the one that I'm finishing now that looks at a five-year retrospect of how the network news portrayed Latinos. It's well documented that the portrayals are not what they should be. As we're taping today, May 7th, 2014, there's a major controversy with MSNBC, the liberal MSNBC, because a day or two ago, in one of its programs, they had some idiotic person, part of the team, dress up with a sombrero, maracas, and some liquor, and run into the stadium back and forth. That happened on Monday because it was May 5th, to portray something about Cinco de Mayo and Mexicans and how they celebrate. How idiotic can that be? The decision makers at these institutions should face the same thing that I'm saying regarding Brazil. We've documented the problem, but they haven't changed their mindset. And it should fall upon the schools of journalism, the decision makers at the school of journalism, the scholars at the schools of journalism, to bring to the decision makers in the news media and in the entertainment media the imperative for better, more diverse, better images that are still not there in our modern society. And I hope that the decisions of these deans and directors of school at some point change from just allowing these and bringing in and, and hiring the minority faculty to do their own studies to move towards the decision makers in the media for which they have some influence 
many of them former students at these institutions, to bring them to the table and say, now it's your time to make a change in the content and the representation of these groups. And still you're going to make money out of it anyway. So you cannot have, and you should not have, the continued stereotyping of these groups or the ignoring of them as it has also been the case. I appreciate this opportunity to share my critical views about the field, my own success, and I look forward to many more years of doing research in this arena and hopefully changing some minds for the better for diversity of all types, but of particular given my background of Latinos in the United States and Puerto Rico, for which I'm doing more research about right now too. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. <coughs> you know, I can't, I can't say it enough, but each one of these 